to Siddhant, you solve all of the questions without any doubt. Sir, I have few doubts. Okay. <clears throat> so also, also, I believe that you don't see any solution, right? Yes, sir. Online. Or do you see some solution of SRM? No, sir. I don't have any uh, source or solution. Very good. Now, this is what I expect from you. So, in case of doubt, uh, it is like uh, my humble request that every time you have doubt, ask me. Don't try to resort to some online resources. The reason is you will not get the idea why they have solved the way they have solved and what are the other possible ways of solving and why you made a mistake. Okay. So just looking at the solution and trying to mug up the solution is not the way to learn uh, physics. You should have the clarity that why we are doing whatever we are doing. Okay. So we'll keep this non-informed circular motion, uh, of course, uh, for horizontal plane. Okay. <laughs> so in this case, uh, the body will have tangential acceleration as well as centripetal both. So in case of uh, <coughs> non
sorry guys. <coughs> so in case of non-informed circumvention, what happens? We have a particle moving <coughs> on a circle track and uh, non form means its, it's a speed is also changing. So to change the speed, what we need? To change the speed, we need tangential acceleration. And uh, <clears throat> whether you want or not, you have to change the direction always. So you need centripetal. And therefore, the total acceleration in case of non information will be somewhere between like this. A. And we have done this, I think, before. So we know how to write the relationship. So this is this is essential part of non-uniform circular motion. So we need some force along the tangent as well. And it will come across this uh, very often. Okay. So how we attempt for I mean, any question? Okay. So the thing is, when we are solving question of uh, non-uniform circular motion, we have to resolve forces along the center and along the tangent. <laughs> <clears throat> and what we can write is, uh, as we have done this before, the net force towards center, we write MAC. But now we have to also write the fact that the net force along the tangent is MAT. Or <clears throat> sometime you will come across that this we can also write as the net force equals to mass into A, which is like the total, this one, total exception. So if you want to resolve the force, <clears throat> Then write the terms to the, write the two equation. But if intention is to write the net force directly without resolving it, then write the A directly, which will look slightly complicated. And you have to write like M A C square plus A T square because you have to find these two terms separately. So A may will always become like this. <laughs> okay. Now this can be written in multiple ways. Let me show you some of the ways. Let's A C you write as V square bar, correct? Whole square and 80, how we write? Sometimes you can also express the same thing like this. Omega square. And tangential accession and the angular accession is having a relation, you know? <laughs> Alpha, right? If you remember. So yes, depending on what is known to you, whether alpha is known to you then try to express in angular format. If you know the velocity and dy dt, express in the, <laughs> the format as shown above. And you can add the net force directly. Now these equations are for the forces in the plane. Okay, so these are planar forces and for that planar force, you're writing this equation. And uh, as we know that if forces are perpendicular to the plane of a circle, that must be in equilibrium and the sum must be zero. So if you remember, the summation of all force perpendicular to plane of motion is always zero. So keeping these simple ideas <laughs> uh, in mind is sufficient to solve any question. Also, what you want to remember is that tangential accession in case of circular motion. Now remember, this is not always true. In case of circular motion, this is only uh, as I have told this, now where this is not applicable, <laughs> so in general it is for general curvy linear motion. And what happens if for uh, circular, since uh, for a circular motion, the AT is same as A theta. So this is a very interesting fact that if the AT is not actually alpha, but AT and A theta are same in case of circular motion, so we write equals to alpha. But if you look, go back in the first lecture, or second lecture, you will realize that uh, the what tangent is for the path, but the a theta is for the angle, incremental direction of angle. So how one should turn to change the, or increase the angle incrementally, okay. <laughs> or infinitesimally. 
So if you remember this, this simple thing, then it's easy for you. Okay. Now, when it comes to the horizontal, oh, so when it comes to the horizontal non-uniform circular motion, so we can have any number of questions, any variety of questions. So let me create a question first of all. So it's a ruler. Okay. It's a very famous question. So we'll be solving two or three challenges you know, uh, just to get the essence of a non form promotion. So we have a ruler and which is maybe uh, fixed to a spindle. And about this spindle, this uh, ruler is set to rotate. <coughs> and it is rotating with a constant uh, angular acceleration alpha. So alpha is right. So the ruler will turn and you know. <clears throat> now on this ruler, what I do is I put a block, a block of size, uh, which will fit on this surface easily. And also the dimension of this block should be ignored compared to the distance of this block from the axis of rotation. So this tiny block, as you can see, this tiny block you can see is kept. Ignore the dimension of the block for the obvious reason. And we assume that the block is kept at a distance L. Now, sometime when you go in the chapter of rotational dynamics, which is your future, <laughs> There, the dimension will come into picture. And solving the same question will be, we will have a different uh, approach. And some new concept will also emerge as you move on in this course. Okay. So, the coefficient of friction. The coefficient of friction between the block and the ruler is, let's say, mean. <laughs> and uh, assume it, it starts from rest. So, what is given to you is alpha. <laughs> So even though you start from rest, the ruler will start turning and the location at which the block is kept, what is the acceleration of the block at this, this instant? So at t equals to zero, tell me something. What is the value of AC? At t zero, what is the AC guys? Tell me person, sir, what is AC? Zero. Very good. <clears throat> so you know AC is zero. Why? Because there is no velocity. Acceleration of velocity. There is no velocity. So because there is no velocity, AC is zero. But what about AT? What is it here? Alpha into L. Hmm. 
no tell me if alpha is constant then at is going to be constant or variable is at constant or variable siddhant So it will be constant. Hmm? Yes, sir, constant. It is constant, or it may be constant. What you are saying? Constant. Hmm. And for constant uh, tangential acceleration, can we use the kinematical equation? Yes, sir. very good so what you need to remember is you may get alpha sometimes given as a function of time t also and sometimes given as constant only when it is constant you will apply the kinematical equation to get the velocity or speed to be honest but when it, alpha is variable you have to use calculus to get uh, the speed so these two types of question will come across you have to be careful that uh, how to approach in you know, the right way So we have to find mu, right?
done so. You got the answer? Yes, sir. Really good. So again, the same method will be same. You draw the ABD first, always a rule number one, you draw the free body diagram. And here the two forces are acting normal to the plane of motion, which means the forces which are normal to the plane of motion. And uh, <clears throat> they are already in equilibrium, which we have discussed already. So these forces are going to be balancing out each other. So without any ado, we can just write n equals to mg. This equation you all should have written, right? Yes. Now comes the issue that like who will rotate this block on this circle? So which other force we have left with? We are left with. Tell me. Friction. Friction. Now which friction? <clears throat> As long as it is not slipping, which friction is acting? Is static or kinetic? Static. Static. Now the question is how the static should act? Should it act like this, like this, or somewhere in between? What? Do you think? How it should act? So to get the better perspective, we can see the top view of the motion. Let's see the top view, and that may help you in looking at the scenario really well. So let's say we have a top view <coughs> and this circle is representing the distance of the axis and the block. So <coughs> you know many times uh, you will also realize that an ability to draw different view of a physical situation greatly enhances the capability to solve the numerator. So if you can see, you know, other view, so this is the side view, this is the top view. And you can clearly see that uh, the, the block will have uh, two types of acceleration, right? After some time, right now it's only 80, but after some time you will have some speed and therefore you will have some centripetal as well. So, <coughs> What is the direction of a total acceleration? So friction is the only force which can provide both, right? Yes. So friction will provide which force? It will provide centripetal as well as tangential. And to provide both the force, I mean, both the effect, it should act in a direction somewhere between in order to have component in both directions. So let's say if I think this is theta. So you can say Fs cos theta will give you what? And centripetal. So the, this is going to as MAC, right? <laughs> and Fs sine theta, what it will give you? Tangent. And to get rid of theta, what it will do? It will you square and add, right? Yes. Sir. That's a simple way. So basically, if you square and add, <laughs> the fs square becomes mac whole square m80 whole square which we can upon simplification will give you the same thing which we have done before right and one thing is clear now we need to substitute so ac we can write as what so you can express in terms of omega because that's easy right so AC becomes omega square R, but R here is L, right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but the question is, is omega given to you? Or we need to express in terms of time. So right now, omega, you know, you start with the zero omega, but as the time will progress, you will have some omega. So can you guys tell me what is the omega as a function of time? Too? So what is the omega as a function of time to tell me how to get that relation? 
Okay, so get that threshold, you can use the kinematical equation, right? Because it's a constant uh, angular acceleration. And because it's constant angular acceleration, you can handle omega. Formula is omega equals to <coughs> omega naught plus alpha two. And therefore, <coughs> you can see something. That Fs becomes M omega square R. So omega square, which means uh, alpha T omega square R whole square plus AT, which is alpha L whole square. <laughs> so Fs turns out to be M. And then it will become alpha power 4 t power 4 l square alpha square l square so one thing is clear that as the time will progress the fs will have to increase the value in order to keep the block rotating on this track so up to what extent you can hold the block on the surface you can only hold till you reach the Limiting friction, correct? Yes, sir. <clears throat> because you cannot keep the block at rest if the required frictional force exceeds the limiting force. So this is called the required frictional force for the event to happen. And we always know that the requirement must be less than or equals to the maximum availability, which is Fs max, the limiting friction. <laughs> so, because we are solving numerical, we can say that uh, M under root of the alpha 4 T4 L square <laughs> should be less than mu s into N. What is normal here? Here N is actually. <coughs> MG, MG. <right>? MG. <coughs> so this must be less than this value. So to get the critical time, like when the slipping will start, we can equate it. We can take the equality instead of inequality. So we can add as alpha power 4, t power 4, L square alpha square l square is equals to mu square g square correct i'm squaring both sides and uh, because we are looking for uh we can can we take common as something here yeah? what you can take common i can take common alpha power for l square you know why i want t to be alone i want to make the coefficient of t as one so t power four <coughs> plus uh, alpha square l square upon how much Alpha 4 L square, right? Yes, sir. Is mu square G square. And uh, therefore, T power 4 plus uh, 1 by alpha square is mu square G square by alpha 4 L square, <coughs> which is like mu G by. Okay, right now we'll back with this. Mu square G square uh, alpha 4 L square. So, okay, anyway, this is not a part. I'll go to the next part. So, T power 4 is how much? <coughs> so I'll take a 1 by alpha power 4 as common. For the obvious reason, the fourth power will become 1. And so I'm left with. Uh, this minus this. Am I right? It is like this one, correct? Yes. And now I have the T. So 
So the moment you reach this critical time, the slipping will start. The nature of friction will change from static to kinetic. <coughs> okay. And it will no longer follow the circular motion. It will just go in some random path and will fall off the, the ruler or the scale. Is this clear? So yes, it is yes, not sir. very difficult. It's very easy to understand. I mean, uh, you will come across the same question in a variety of ways. I'll show you two more questions, which are uh, very interesting, very challenging in a way. These are like all of that kind of question. But even the question of that difficulty can be solved with ease if you understand the process. Okay? And that's why I always emphasize that uh, instead of looking at the difficulty, try to understand the concept. <laughs> So this is called bead in a rod. So you might have seen, uh, you may have a some plastic tube and there is a ring which you can, you know, just slide through the tube. And I'm um, imagining that, okay, there's a roughness between the tube and the the ring so it will have some frictional force as well and also we have to assume that uh, the size of the ring is exactly very close to the size the diameter of the or you can say the circumference of both are roughly same slightly more just to you know sit inside the tube otherwise it will never be that way. so the question is similar uh, we have a rod Just draw slightly bigger to give you the the right perspective. So <coughs> this is the axis, and uh, we have a ring. So as you can see, the ring is here. And again, this ring is kept at a distance. L from the axis. Similar question, nothing I'm going to change. And, uh, And it also starts from rest. So it also starts from rest. Okay. <laughs> okay. First of all, tell me. As okay, as of now, of course, at t equals to zero, the AC is zero because there is no velocity. But AT is there, right? How much? And again, because alpha is constant, which means the AT is going to be constant, and therefore the kinematical equation can be applied. That's this is what we know, right? <clears throat> My question to you is, which force can provide the required centripetal force? 
any guess? Tell me which force can provide, and of course the coefficient of friction is given. I mean, the mu is there. In fact, let's say it's a mu s, but okay, let's call it. It's a friction. Friction. And uh, friction can act. This is the biggest I mean, uh, question to this problem. You know, friction acts to oppose the relative tendency of motion, right? The relative tendency of motion of point to point. So, what is the tendency of this uh, ring to slide inward or outward when you start rotating? What do you think? Sir, outward. Very good. So, how the friction will act? Towards the axis inward. Towards the axis. Very good. So, <clears throat> what you realize is absolutely correct that the frictional force. <laughs> will have no choice but to act like this. But if it is acting like this, then one thing is clear that it will provide the centripetal force. But is it possible for this friction to provide the tangential force? Think about it. Through FBD, not through intuition, but through some visualization, if you can create some visualization. So, will it provide the centripetal, tangential, or both? Sir, only centripetal. Very good. So, now the question is because whenever a particle will have tangential acceleration, you always need some tangential force. I'm mean, sorry, yeah, some tangential force. Then only you can accelerate in that direction. So, the question is who will provide that tangential force? <laughs> Any guess? Who will provide? No idea. So it is again the normal. It is the normal. This is a very interesting and unique question in which <coughs> the weight of the ring is also balanced by normal, but I'll just name it as NY. And it is the normal which will also provide the required <coughs> and now I'll try to show you the view. Let's say if you watch from this side. Then you can have a better visualization. You know how it will look like? If you have this view, the ring is like this. <coughs> this is the rod cross section. And as I said, your ability to draw diagrams will greatly enhance your problem solving ability. And who will teach this? The answer is no one. So as a student, uh, I always try to create a multiple dimensional view of the same problem, at least to get the better visualization. And physics is all about uh, visualization. You know what, how the normal is acting? See, the normal is only due to one particular contact and therefore normal is acting like this. The net normal, or the normal reaction or the reaction force or the contact force is something like this. In fact, I can slightly make it more realistic by touching it. Like this. <clears throat> so it is touching not at the top, not at the right side. It is touching somewhere in between because of the two acceleration. <clears throat> and therefore it will have two components nx and ny 
and it is the NX which is actually giving the required tangential acceleration and the NY is balancing the gravity. And of course, the normal is acting this way. Do you realize this? <laughs> yes. So what we are supposed to write here is that N cross theta epsi normal is only one, but now we are seeing the component, how the normal is behaving. So N cross theta is what balancing the gravity and it is the N sine theta is what giving you the required tangential acceleration. And therefore, what is the normal actually? So normal is usually you have to use per and add. Correct. So if you square and what do you get? You get M. <laughs> and therefore, the FS we have to write as mu s into this N. Earlier, how we used to write MG, right? But is it MG? The answer yes. is no, it is no longer MG. And that is why this question is. Uh, supposed to be the challenging problem and uh, it requires much more visualization than the regular problem. I'm trying to give you the different perspective. <laughs> if you're able to understand this, uh, it's really big deal. So this is G square plus uh, eight is square. And again, we know that what is A T, how to write A T, it is alpha into L. And uh, uh, we are done. So here, the equation of motion, what you're going to write is? You're going to write as Fs for circular motion. Fs must be less than equals to its limiting value, correct? <coughs> yes which means mu into m into under root of g square plus a t square must be less than equals to mu into, oh, my bad. And we have to add the centripetal equation. No? So the net force towards the center is how much? F is equals to m omega square l, correct? So this is Fs max, my bad. This is Fs max, what I'm writing. So Fs max is mu into n, and that's why mu m g square plus t square. This is how we are going to get the Fs max. Fs is actually equals to m omega square l, right? <coughs> and for circular motion, what we know that Fs, the centripetal force is uh, provided by the friction. This friction force should be less than limiting value. So m omega square l <coughs> is less than equals to <coughs> So this is entirely constant on the right side. And now you can square it. So omega power four L square is less than equals to mu square G square plus. And we know how to replace omega. Alpha T. Look at this. Omega is alpha t. Omega power 4 is how much? Alpha t power, alpha power 4, t power 4. So L square. So t power 4 is how much? And uh, you know that the T turns out to be uh, take everything inside, keep one by alpha and uh, mu square. So this is how you can explain the answer. Does it make sense to you? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you can see that gravity also needs some balancing force, and uh, to push tangentially, we need some force. But unfortunately, the frictional force cannot do the the you know role of tangential force because of the rod. Uh, you can't slide tangentially. You, you, you cannot have relative motion in the tangential direction because of the constraint, and therefore you have to resort to a, something different. And this is how you get the answer. So these are really challenging problems, not easy at all. I, I don't consider this to be easy uh, for any beginner. <laughs> but the process is not very difficult. If you can understand these two portions of non-uniform, uh, you can do any question. So I'll go to some very interesting question. So imagine we have a cylindrical dome. So what we are going to do in this case is, is you can see there is a cylindrical uh, surface and uh, of course we have a base. But our base is frictionless. Generally what I do is I do not you know write the exact question, the exact wording. <laughs> So I give a lot of information that this is this, this is this. Basically, these all are very standard problems in uh, circular motion, which will come across in S. Verma and other book also. And my idea is if I write a question, it looks like question answer. So it should look like a theory. Okay. So we have frictionless, frictionless base, but we have the rough wall. And now <laughs> imagine I give you a block. So this block is touching the this block is touching the what? The wall. And I can see these all are visualization. I mean how one can think of, uh, I have no clue. Uh, you all have to start visualizing at some point of time to, you know, make better sense out of it. So <clears throat> at some point of time, you have to start visualizing. And uh, this block has given a tangential velocity v naught and tangential to the wall. So this is given a velocity v naught at t equals to zero. <laughs> okay. Now, what would be the better picture of this? So as I said, you always, I mean, 
have to you know think of some view which can greatly enhance the per perception of the situation and i think uh, the top view is going to be best right if yes, you look from this side so if you look from the top how the diagram should look like can you guess It's really fun, you know, drawing the views. <laughs> and it is like this, you, you know, someone has thrown like this, right? Which was the V not now this makes sense, right? Now yes. this is the this is the top view. It doesn't mean gravity will come into picture, right? So it is also the right place at which we can draw the ABD. So this is at t equals to zero. So whenever it comes to drawing the ABD, uh, we prefer drawing at some in general case. So let me. <coughs> Let me do it here. It doesn't matter. You can do anywhere. It is just a matter of convenience uh, for me. So how the ABD will look like? The ABD which matters. So as you throw like this, it will make contact with the vertical wall, right? So vertical wall will push in which direction? So the vertical wall will push the block in in the direction towards the center, right? Yes, sir. So this is the normal reaction due to the wall. Let's call it NX. And there is definitely another normal which uh, we are not bothered to infect uh, <laughs> right. But in some Olympiad level question, when they mention the friction at the base as well, it's a different ball. I mean, different game altogether. So it's very interesting and more, uh, you can say, difficult question. So now, okay, we are ignoring the friction because see, in, there is a difference. When you say JE questions, the J mains question, Olympiad question, they just keep on adding layer of concept. And when they add too many layers, it becomes too difficult in terms of calculation also in terms of thinking also and <clears throat> what is difficulty difficulty is like not being able to understand that how to you know start with the problem not able to think that okay what is the right approach which concept should be fetched first not able to draw the ABD <laughs> so every day if you solve question even one or two questions which are very challenging and if it consumes let's say one or two hours your brain will go to a different level altogether and this practice doesn't need to be done every day but in the beginning years if you are doing for first year uh, your thinking will improve your uh, analytical ability will improve you can write a question with ease you can draw diagrams with ease <coughs> so when i draw question when i solve question in the classroom it's it's actually very these are very challenging questions me doing it looks easy but I can understand, and it is totally understandable that these are not easy. I mean, how uh, a first year person, I mean, learning physics for the first time, can actually go through all this analysis at once. It's not easy, but this is how we learn. We have to first see somewhere, uh, hear it, and then develop our perception so that when we see it for the next time, we know how to approach it. <laughs> So because of the, the wall, which is a rough wall, and we have the coefficient of friction uh, mu between the wall and the, uh, the block. So as you slide along the surface of the wall, when you reach here, your speed will decrease or increase. Your speed will decrease, correct? Hello, hello, am audible? Yes. Okay. The next part is, this is the normal extension. Which other force I should draw here? 
that the wall will exert on the block it's a friction and it should be acting along the v or positive v opposite opposite to very good so this friction is by virtue of which normal the ny or nx nx and this friction is going to be kinetic or static Kinetic. Kinetic. Very good. Because it is rubbing the surface, right? <laughs> yes. Sir. And kinetic friction is having a ready-made formula. I mean, you need not to wait for the condition. You can just write mu n. But which n? Mu n x. Do you realize this? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> so once you realize this. Once you assume the suitable variable, which is uh, v at any instant, can you write the laws of motion here? Just write the laws of motion. Tell me what is what are the laws of motion? Here. So who will tell me the first part? The net force towards the center. What should I? So net force towards the center is how much? Which force you see towards center? Tell me. Center. So which force when in the ABD? What I should write here? So NX. And what you should be shot on the right? NX equals to M times. So V square. NX down. equals to M times. Omega square. So do you think that omega is the right variable here? I mean, this is also kind of learning that what is the right variable here? <laughs> it is a particle. It is not on a rotatory object, right? So what we should write here? And a radius is given to you, R. So V square by? So that's correct. We should write V square by. And uh, how to add the tangential force? Net force towards the tangent equals to M A T. <laughs> now this is really interesting. How are you going to write? Tell me what we should write. Tell me. Hello, hello, hello. Which force is tangential force here? Kinetic function. And friction. And is it acting in the direction of velocity or opposite to velocity? Opposite. opposite. So whenever it is opposite to the motion, you have to act with minus sign. So we'll add minus mu into nx. Let's say if I add some other force, let's say uh, applied force f, then you should have written actually f minus fk. Correct? Yes. Yes, sir. So whenever you have a force opposite to velocity vector, it should be written with minus sign in case of laws of motion. Because the law of motion simply says that force along the acceleration, I mean, this is how we assume, we take as positive. I mean, the force which supports the acceleration, we take as positive and which opposes, we take as negative. But in this case, because we want to get a differential equation, <coughs> we have to be careful with the sign. If it is retardation, you should be writing negative, right? That's the whole idea. But anyway, 
So minus mu times nx. And this is the only force, right? Do we have any other force? No. See, we are done. So from one and two, we will get the AT. What is AT now? From one and two. Please do write along with me. So minus V square by R into mu. Okay, so AT turns out to be minus mu V square by R, right? This is what you say? Yes, yes. And do you realize this is the differential equation? Do you realize this is differential equation? Anyone who realizes this is differential equation? Because AT we can write as dv by dt, right? This is the rate of change of a speed is called AT, right? Yes, sir. And this is your differential question of V and T because V is varying with time. So the V and T is differential question. And the next step is how to solve differential question. When we know the variables and it is only binary variable, we have just two variables, you need not to worry. And the beauty of this differential equation is can be rearrange one variable on one side and other variable on the other side. Is it variable separable? Can we separate the variables here? Which means can we put a equal sign one side of equal with one particular variable and other side with one particular variable? Remember that mu and r are constants. They are not variables, right? How to understand variable? The differentiation part will tell you what are variables. So dv by dt means the v and t are variables. variables. Variable. <laughs> so only v and t are variables, rest are constants. Can we separate the variable? Yes. yes. Okay. So we know that the v is varying with t at this relation, by this relation. So when something varies with time, with a given relation on the right hand side, it means it must have some actual relation in time, isn't it? Imagine the reverse process that V is function of uh, time, which you differentiate to get this relation, isn't it? <coughs> hello, hello. Do you realize what I'm saying? Yes. And therefore, you need to know how to solve differential equation. <coughs> differential question, the purpose of solving a differential question is to get to know the relation from where you came to this present relation. Like if the differentiation is this much, what is the actual relation between them? So I know dv by dt is something. Then what is v and t relation? This is called solving. So how to go from differential to the exact form? So to go from differential to exact form, we have to reverse the process. And the reverse of differentiation, what we call integration, right? So whenever you solve differential equation, you have to actually integrate. <coughs> but to integrate, there are some rules. You can only integrate one type of variables. Okay, so if you remember the integration rule, the integrator can integrate variable of its kind. So first of all, you have to separate the integrator and the integrator must be in the numerator. So if dt is below, make it in the numerator side and then rearrange the things. <laughs> because mu and r are constant, you can ignore it. I mean, take it out of the integration. And then you start writing something as lower limit. So when time is zero, we know that uh, you threw 
with velocity v naught and so after some time t elapsed the velocity turned to be v and i think this is easy to be solved i hope you all know the integration the basic integration the power yes sir. so can you guys solve and tell me the answer So what do we have to find? What was the differential equation? Which, what are the variables here? V and T. So what you will find? V as a function of time T. Like V equals to what? The purpose of solving every differential equation to relate the variables. When you write y equals to x square, what is y equals to x square? It's a relation. It's a function. <coughs> Correct? This is called yes, function, sir. right? So let's say yes. someone is saying that dy dx is 2x. And then asking you the reverse question. What is y and x actual relation? What do they have given? So we say the actual relation is... Uh, can you mention the initial condition? So you can say, yeah, at uh, x0, y0. You will say, fine, I can do it now. So you will try dy equals to 2x dx. And you integrate. You say when x is 0, y is also 0. So when x is x, y is y. So you get y equals to 2 and x square by 2. <coughs> and then you put the limit from 0 to x, which will again give you only x square. So the purpose of solving differential equations to go back to the relation from where it came actually. So that's why you study function relation in mathematics. And also you have done the same thing in uh, mathematical tools. So have you ever revised the mathematical tools? At least the notes? Never. I know it. Because you're not getting time, actually. You guys are so busy. If someone are, I mean, more busy than our Prime Minister Modi, it's you guys, actually. 
any good. So now you can solve. So I got the answer, the answer. T is equal to minus R by mu into T minus V naught by V V. So, okay, what is the integration of uh, dv by v square? What I'll get after in uh, integration? v minus v naught by v into v naught. Yeah, so the after integration, we get a 1 by v, right? Yes. Sir. This, which is substitute from here to here, right? And 0 to t dt will give you just t only. <coughs> and then you put the lower limit. And see, whenever v are minus, we can just uh, reverse the order and make it plus. That's also a nice way of doing things. So you can write as upper limit minus. Okay. And rest you know how to do it. So 1 by V was 1 by V naught plus Okay. So one by V, you can add as uh, R plus uh, mu V naught T upon R V naught. So V turns out to be R V naught upon It is clear. So you can find V as a time function. Does it make sense to you? Yes. Yes, sir. So what you realize that uh, V will decrease as time will increase, right? That's logical. And when V will be zero, when T tends to infinity, correct? Only one particular time, you see, we don't have the exact relation that when V will be zero, but we can say that V is going to be zero when T will tend to infinity. <laughs> Isn't it? So this is basically a hyperbolic relation. So if you plot a graph of V versus T, so you start from V naught, and it will decrease as t will progress, and but it will never become zero. It will become asymptotic graph. <coughs> so it will meet at infinity. Understood? Hello, 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 hello. Yes, sir. That's it. So the other relation that they are keen to ask you in the question examination that what is the v and uh, the distance relation so we have a relation a t equals to minus mu v square by r but now i'm looking for a relationship between the the distance and uh, the speed not the speed and time that we are going to change so we have to express a t in that fashion which can relate distance so how we write 80 to have this dd by ds excellent so v d by ds will become minus mu v square by r and then v gets cancelled so what you see here is dv by d is minus mu by r ds then you integrate you, you travel nothing velocity v not you travel something you have velocity v <laughs> And what is the integration of d v by v? L and v. So upper limit minus lower limit. Which is basically v by v naught ln. So v by v naught is e, e power mu s by r. And uh, of course, there's a third way, which uh, you said in the very beginning that then write in, in terms of omega, of course you can write. 
<clears throat> so sometimes they will ask you express the speed as an angle traversed. So we know that s equals to r theta. So basically, s r is actually angle traversed. So the v becomes v not e power minus mu theta, right? You can check here. Mu s by r. S by r we can replace by theta. Correct. And because you can replace s by r by theta, it becomes v not e power minus mu theta. <laughs> and because v equals to omega, so basically this omega is so basically omega is not given, right? <laughs> so if you want to write, you can write, but uh, omega is not given to you. So v you can write as omega r. V naught is given to us. That's why we started with the, the velocity relation, not the omega relation. But anyway, you can always express the way you want. And then you can say d theta by dt equals to, so you can say e power mu theta d theta is V naught by r dt. And then again, you can take it. many many things you can derive so e power mu theta will become the same integration upon mu if you know the integration rule and in case of exponential relation the lower limit will always give you non-zero answer so you have to be very careful that whenever we have exponential or cosine relation <coughs> the zero will not give you zero so e power zero becomes one actually so what you get is e power mu theta uh, minus one upon uh, mu okay so the time and the angle relation is also possible so there's so many types of relation right so you just manipulate things and keep on getting them new and new answer so this is i think question number 28 right So in SU Arma, you can go to SU Arma, the chapter of circular motion. <clears throat> and I hope you can see the question. 27. Yeah, this is 27. They have mentioned everything. So no need to worry, like how to solve. They have mentioned that how to solve. And the rest I have discussed today. And now I can go to the centrifugal force. Today we are going to finish this chapter. So any doubt in this so far, tell me? No, sir. Okay. See, there is, and there are endless questions. I can keep on but you first extend the basic first. Uh, S. Verma is really, really good book for this particular chapter uh, without any doubt, okay? All right. So, centrifugal <clears throat> So, do you feel that you have some weight? So, right now, if you are sitting on a chair, which I expect, I hope that you're not lying on the bed. So if you're sitting on a chair, do you feel that you, you, you are being pulled by the gravity? No, sir. So do you feel that you are pressing the chair at least? Yes. The cushion of your chair is getting pressed at least? Okay, if you have cushion, if you don't have cushion, then your uh, maybe thighs are getting pressed by the surface below it, isn't it? Some pressing force are you experiencing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So <clears throat> the idea of human weight as perceived by the brain comes from the contact force that we experience. So there is no absolute basis of understanding our own weight. So when you 
do the free fall or any person doing the free fall can he or she perceive his own weight is it possible <laughs> so sometime if you enter the lift and you switch some press the button and the moment the lift it starts you feel for a moment a lighter when it goes down right so when you press the button to go down for a moment you feel lighter than your actual weight isn't it yes sir. have you experienced this anyone who has experienced this yes sir. having very clear memory of the same yeah tell me guys everyone yes, so you sir. all have experience now tell me why you feel the way you feel Because a suddenly falling elevator or lift reduces the normal reaction which your foot or your feet experiences. So the reduction in the normal reaction as experienced by the feet will let you perceive that you're lighter. <laughs> so what if I remove the normal reaction at all? Will you feel at all? The answer is no, you will feel wetlessness. So every freely falling object without any contact cannot experience the gravity effect. So gravity is the brain, you know, it is something in your brain. And you have some sort of idea which you don't realize, but you have some idea, okay, I am heavy, I am light. And when you go and do the rock climbing or rappelling, so now in Amazon Park, they you know create a small rock climbing uh, as a fun activity so you can uh, have the hardness and you can climb the the artificial mountain have you seen this in some amazon park maybe some mall also they are offering for the small kids anyone has done this before the amateur rock climbing yes sir I have done. okay great so when you try to pull your yourself what you pull is your hand is trying to lift your own weight right and yes. there you feel there you feel that how heavy you are because uh, <clears throat> to go against the gravity the hand and the the surface which you are touching creates enormous normal reaction or reaction force and uh, by creating a force more than your own body weight or uh, more than the gravitational pull, you actually lift yourself. Okay, so the center mass of the body goes up. And of course, your muscle will help you. So you are going up because the force acting on your hand is actually more than mg. So your, your center mass is accelerating upward, which you don't realize. Okay, so that is there. <clears throat> so in a variety of experience, uh, a situation when the contact force changes, our perception changes. So the <coughs> perception of your own weight is due to the some contact force. And in the absence of contact force, you don't feel at all. So centrifuge was one necessity, you know, because in uh, uh, for orbiting uh, satellites or uh, for astronauts, you know, orbiting, uh, we know that uh, they, they don't feel gravity because they are falling under gravity. Okay. And not experiencing gravity is not a good idea because uh, you have been, you know, you bond with this uh, perception and your uh, brain will function when you feel gravity. The moment I remove the gravity, you become uncontrollable. So it, it is difficult to control your own movement because you need some gravity. <laughs> and to have gravity, we just need contact force. That's it. So the way the spaceships are designed, the space stations are the ISS, you know, the International Space Station, the, the way they're designed, they create a round loop, a circle, a, a giant wheel you can think of. And the giant wheel will have some hollow tubing, you know, in which they have a entire life. They have the laboratory, they have the equipment, they have their uh, sleeping area, uh, they have gym and everything else. And if I try to show you this uh, artificial 
lab you are not seeing anything okay <clears throat> so it is like a a big tube like tubular structure and this is the cross sectional view this is where you live <clears throat> and what we do is to create this artificial sense of gravity <clears throat> okay it is rotated about this one axis at some omega and in fact you will come to know that the iss is so big that the diameter is roughly 2 km long you know this yeah imagine the iss is 2 km long diameter it's a huge space actually and then when it turns the person sitting here will be you know kind of pushed towards the wall and this will become like earth so you feel this is earth and you can stand with ease like this so your sense of vertical will change from the way it was on earth now your sense of vertical is this this is your vertical so the towards the center becomes a vertical and then this is horizontal so they design every equipment on this part so that you can walk like this so you, you exactly feel it's like a ground and this is the vertical <coughs> and it is rotated like omega square r is given close to the value of g because giving large omega is not a good idea so they make a large r and you can see that how much omega we need to create the artificial gravity so to create the artificial gravity uh what we need omega is let's call it, and g is that at uh, you know at iss the g will decrease like this it's 9. maybe 7 so i'll keep it 9.8 only and r is 2 km which is sorry r is how much 1 km which is 1000 meter right so let's just to make it calculation easy let's do 100 uh this way and uh, okay i'll just so 10 upon 1000 which is very easy to calculate How much is this? One by ten radian per second, right? So one by ten radian per second. If you start your fan at this radian per second, you will see fan is slowly turning, right? And one by ten radian per second is not a big deal, right? <coughs> so what is the time period? Two pi omega, which is like the twenty pi second. Twenty into three point one four. How much is that, roughly? So it's sixty second, right? More than sixty. It means the the entire ISS will take more than a minute to make one rotation. And it looks so from the outer space. It looks like it's moving really slow, but <clears throat> because of the size, you can imagine. it is able to create the artificial gravity which matches with the earth and this artificial gravity will create the same contact force on your feet as you feel on the earth and therefore your brain will be at ease in functioning so as you not actually go lot of adjustment in the outer space they have to mentally adjust to so many things that's why uh, their body over the time becomes very fragile because the gravity is not that strong always they are not working always on the uh, the uh, periphery they sometimes go from the tube to into the tube so they work under various gravitational uh, force and uh, the bone density also decreases over the time so when they spend one year and see our body is always kind of uh, pulled by the gravity which keeps certain structure intact together so <laughs> over the time their bone density decreases when they come back to earth uh, they take months to kind of readjust to this new gravitational environment so we have habit of you know standing under certain gravity so if you go to a planet where gravity is much more than what you have uh, been experiencing so far uh, you won't be able to stand and it is very obvious to understand let's say can you stand with keeping a 50 kg weight on your head or 100 kg is it possible so can you lift 100 kg and stand properly no sir. no can you run 
So if I tell you, if I give you five kg and if I tell you run, you will fall, isn't it? Do you realize what I'm saying? So the idea yes. is <clears throat> the increased gravitational weight will make your uh, standing phenomena also different. But similarly, if I give you a very less gravity, like if you go to moon, where the gravitational force is just one sixth of the earth, there you will feel a lot lighter. In fact, you won't feel very much, you know, you won't feel the traction, the grip with the surface. So you will feel that there is no grip. And again, it's difficult for you to control your movement. You will start falling, jumping, you will make a, a long stride because uh, you push the ground with some strength and gravity will not bring you back with that ease. A sudden push can create enough normal to accelerate you upward because the gravity is very small. <laughs> so on Earth, if you want to jump, you have to press the Earth at certain uh, with certain force. But on Moon, <laughs> you need to actually press with lot lesser force. But because of your habit, you end up pushing with the same force because your body will act in the same way. And then you will realize that okay, because of the force, you have created a large acceleration. And therefore, you will jump to a very long height. You can jump maybe up to 50 meters on moon. Yeah. So, okay. Anyway, so the idea is, the thing is, the centrifugal force is actually <coughs> not at all a force. It is a way to remain in contact. Okay. And uh, it is, at the end, it's uh, the same contact force. But... Uh, it is a force which we experience due to inertia. Okay. Hello, Kanu, are you there? Kanu, are you there? Hello, hello, hello. Kanu, can you listen? So this is, okay, anyway. So this is 11th batch. I mean, you want to learn this chapter, you can stay, but uh, otherwise it's a, a regular batch. Okay. Not 12th. So the idea of centrifugal force, I mean, of course, uh, this is just an idea. I mean, uh, do, does it exist? The answer is no, there's no such existence. <laughs> So the force is still the normal reaction and uh, uh, some gravity, some friction. These are the forces in nature. There is nothing like a centrifugal force in nature. But why we explain, why we understand. So the root cause behind this explanation is inertia. So inertia let you feel something which is not actually present. And it is about like, you know, your experience. Okay, so to understand this better. See, this is the one application. So the artificial gravity is something NASA or uh, ISS uh, keeps on exploring, keeps on creating because they want to live under similar condition in terms of perception. And uh, centrifuge having a lot of application. Uh, the application is like uh, in blood specimen, if you want to study the uh, platelets, RBC, WBC, or other components. So you may think that blood is one single liquid, but blood is like a mixture of uh, a large variety of uh, compounds, molecules, and uh, other, uh, you can say, a small cell. And they all differ in density, actually. So they have different densities. So what we have is called a centrifuge machine, okay, in lab, in pathological lab, they have that machine, which can rotate at very high RPM. RPM is the rotational per minute. So they have RPM which goes to millions of RPM. Now what happens when these specimens are kept uh, in those uh, centrifuges, what we call centrifuge, it is called actually. The inertia, the variation of inertia will let you feel different centrifugal force. You can think this way. So because everything having different density, so they feel different centrifuges. So the densest will go to the outer periphery and the lightest will be near the axis. 
and that is how they separate the specimen and the moment they get separated they take out the you know distance wise sample and that is how they calculate the counts of platelets and something because you they know that it's very easy if i take let's say one nanogram or uh, one microgram and if you know these are the platelets in these many micrograms so they kind of estimate uh, by simple uh, unitary method but to do the same thing nowadays we have device so device will take the picture and uh, it is kind of a uh, uh, scaling device so they take the picture and from picture they estimate the count so everything is done automatically it's not uh, like you have to do this actual calculation but they have to take this specimen they have to put on slides and they have to go through the micro uh, probe and from there they make the count of uh, platelets rbc wbc and other uh, composition of the blood okay <laughs> that's very interesting actually so that is in medical science also the centrifuge is having a huge application it's not only nasa is doing it in fact the entire medical research is based on the separation of things now imagine a virus is so thin so small so small so light in weight that you cannot separate them they are part of the liquid and uh, the kind of centrifuge which is required to separate them may be in tens of millions of rpm so we have to actually create a, a tremendous artificial gravity to actually separate those uh, lightest object in, in nature so you can understand that this whole idea of uh, uh, virus bacteria pathogens and so many other things it depends on their density their weight their molecular weight and eventually this uh, centrifuges are very helpful devices which can uh, separate them based on their mass or density mm -hmm. so that's one other application in medical science uh, in physics we said okay there is very common application which you all uh, might have experienced at home called the washing machine okay so you put the wet clothes and you rotate the the cylinder the drum what you call drum and uh, the water is not physically connected right? the water is like a free thing it is absorbed between the fiber so the moment you set into rotation what you do is the same thing the inertia will let the water to move tangentially but the cloth cannot go tangentially because of the the obstacle the wall of the drum but the drum will have the holes to let the water go out but the keep the cloth within and by rotating as fast as possible you kind of uh, throw out all the water out of the cloth okay so that is how you dry the cloth but of course you cannot uh, pull the last uh, drop you have to actually dry in air uh, with some heat or some uh, sunlight <laughs> So the remaining water uh, uh, absorbed in the fiber will be uh, kind of evaporated by the uh, surrounding temperature. So that is how you actually dry the clothes. And it's a very interesting, we again use centrifuge, but that's the washing machine. So the similar thing centrifuge we use for the, you know, uh, kind of separating the, the cream from the uh, maybe uh, different part the fat part of the cream so what we call malai and you separate and you create a uh, after heating create a ghee okay so again that also use the centrifuge so in many fermentation process uh, uh, the the milk is actually coagulation it's a it is not liquid it is called the milk is something very strange it is dissolving lot of solid particulate matter and these solid particles are uh, tiny in size and therefore they remain dissolved. But uh, when you kind of uh, uh, do this centrifugal, you do the stirring, I mean, vigorously. And if you add some coagulation material, let's say you add uh, the lemon juice or vinegar, and these are coagulating, you know, uh, material, they coagulate means they bring those tiny particles together and they start sticking to each other and therefore they get separated from the entire uh, milk so that's how you get the the paneer okay or the cottage cheese again i mean uh, we use technique like centrifuge again here also in some cases there are many more applications of centrifuge but the whole idea of centrifugal force is to do with the inertia it is it has nothing to do with the basically a force actually it's an idea this idea uh, the human perception has given a name centrifugal 
so to get this idea even more better let me draw something uh, hopefully this will help you in realizing the idea with ease it's very easy i'll just show you So let's say it's a your normal sheet and there is a turning okay so this is the turning okay so you are in a car or maybe in a bus or whatever and then you make a turn so this is your car <laughs> so the bugatti variant is your car or lamborghini or porsche whatever And on the dashboard of the car, so it will have a dashboard and you put some glass or cup. So after finishing uh, the coffee from the Starbucks, you put this cup on the dashboard. And then it selects extremely flat road without any bump. <laughs> and you're just driving a car with constant speed. And the cup will stand there without uh, anything because the cup will have the same velocity as that of the car. And therefore it looks like they are, it, they are moving together but both are moving due to the inertia. And when you move with constant velocity, there is no acceleration. It means none of the cup or the dashboard are experiencing force due to each other. So what is driving the cup forward? The answer is inertia, because inertia is a property by virtue which you maintain the your state of motion, isn't it? This ability to maintain the inertia is part of nature. I mean, we haven't uh, developed this property it is a nature which decides okay and this property is like inherent to nature okay now when you when you decide to take a turn on the left of this road because the road is curving and turning left so if you do so it is not very easy for cup to make the similar adjustment as that of the car so your car may adjust very quickly it is it may be possible that your car is having very good tires and with the help of a very good grip on the road you are able to make the turn with ease so what you expect is that your cup should be here Okay, look up here. Now, what is happening is <coughs> maybe not a right diagram. Uh, I have shifted this too much. So, so anyway, this is the actual path of the cup. This is the direction of inertia of the cup. And now, what is happening? You're trying to turn the car, but cup cannot turn instantly. So, where the cup will hit? So maybe I should uh, draw a better one just, just a minute. Let me draw this. But I hope you have understood, right? Yes, sir. So this is the direction of cup motion. When you turn the car, cup will try to maintain its original direction of motion without changing. You know, that's interesting. So when you make the turn, I can just keep it. 
Yes. Okay, you're turning at this anyway. So <coughs> forces responsible for the turning of car are not the same forces responsible for turning of the cup. The cup will turn because of the <laughs> the frictional force uh, acting between the cup and the dashboard, which may not be sufficient in many cases. And even if it is sufficient, the cup is not a point object, it's a long object. So bottom of the cup will try to turn. So what will happen? The bottom will make a turn. So bottom will turn as the car will turn. But the top of the cup will try to maintain the same path. And therefore, the cup will fall like this. Now, a person within the car cannot explain the inertia. So if you ask the driver why the cup has fallen towards the right, he will be clueless. So the laws of motion becomes uh, kind of invalid for such a driver. And that is the case. Actually, laws of motion is not applicable for non-inertial frame of reference. <laughs> But if you force the driver to write the laws of motion, he has to create a fictitious force to kind of explain this event. And this fictitious force that the driver will tell you is what we call centrifugal force. So what exactly is centrifugal force? It is a force acting opposite to the radial direction. So it is a pseudo force actually. So when you turn, you create centripetal accession. You create a centripetal accession. So your car is a non-inertial object of frame and your car will have an acceleration towards the center. And we know that the property of pseudo forces, it acts opposite to the acceleration of the frame. Isn't it? Hello? Tell me. Yes. So how does pseudo force acts? Pseudo force act opposite to the acceleration of the frame. So car acceleration, what is the, the radial component of acceleration of car? A radial component component of acceleration of car and this car is your non-inertial frame of reference isn't it do you realize this maybe but the force which you apply i mean in the frame of the car only the centrifugal force will have a meaning, right? So the, what is a pseudo force on the object you're analyzing in the car frame? So if I take a mass M, which I'm analyzing, this is not car, this is my uh, cup actually. So cup is a mass. <coughs> if you want to, if you want to write the laws of motion in the frame of car, what will do? What will you do? You will apply a pseudo force and the pseudo force in the radial direction. If you remember how we write the pseudo force, this is called the radial pseudo force. Radial pseudo force. Okay. This radial pseudo force is called centrifugal force there is nothing like centrifugal force so the radial component of pseudo force because of the you know the decision you have taken to write the laws of motion in non inertial frame which you should not actually but sometimes we have no choice but to write the laws of motion in that frame because that's easy to you know uh, to see the path the motion is uh, easy to be observed or to be explained if in the frame we are sitting is 
an easy frame. I should write the answer in that frame, but doing the same, <coughs> we have to add the pseudo force and the radial component of pseudo force is called centrifugal force. So when to use centrifugal force, guys, tell me. Mm -hmm. It is only used when you're trying to write the laws of motion in which frame? Non-inertial non frame. Yeah, like turning frame, rotating frame, non-inertial frame. But here the centrifugal is the radial component because a car may be turning with non-uniform motion. So it means a car may have the tangential acceleration. Okay. <coughs> And then the pseudo force by virtue of this reason, by virtue of the tangential expression, you again have the tangential pseudo force. Tangential pseudo force. But this is not called centrifugal. This is only called pseudo force. Okay. So the centrifugal force, <coughs> which I write as uh, FCF, centrifugal. So what are the takeaways? Centrifugal force is MAC. It is not MA. Because MA is called pseudo force. Understood? So the actual direction of acceleration of car is something like this. Correct? So actual pseudo force should be like this. This was the total suit of force. So what should the definition of centrifugal force? It is the it is the component of pseudo force acting in the radial direction away from the center. That's it. Very simple. Tell me guys, can we define like this? Centrifugal force. How to define? It is the component of pseudo force in the radial direction acting <coughs> away from center. So because it's a, it's a pseudo force, so we have to use it when we try to write the laws of motion in non inertial frame. Otherwise, there is no need for this. Is this clear? When do you think of this force? When you're trying to solve question in which frame? Non inertial frame. That's it. So it will act as like some sort of uh, force. So you can think as force, but it is, uh, it is consequence of inertia. It is experienced due to it is experienced it is perceived i won't say experience it's perceived like you think that there is a force And pseudo force we have done in laws of motion. So I don't think you will find this difficult. Okay. So not all pseudo force are centrifugal, right? Because this is also sent, uh, this is also pseudo force. This is also pseudo force. So this is the actual one. These are the components. This is, and these are components. But which component we call centrifugal? the radial component understood hello 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 yes. it's clear okay. so once you realize that it's easy to write you just write m a c but that show it in the uh readily outward direction your job is done <clears throat> so is it necessary to solve question the answer is sometime but not always so I'll give you one question which we have done before without this idea. And now we'll do again with this idea. So we have done something called conical problem. Okay. Conical pendulum. Okay. So 
using centrifugal force concept. <coughs> So imagine we have a pendulum. Which is rotating. About a vertical axis. Okay. So it is rotating over the vertical axis. <laughs> so in the ground frame, what you do, you simply say this is mg and this is uh, nothing. This is there's nothing, nothing like this. So we have mg and t ground frame FDD. I hope this is. Let to you guys, we have done this before. So what I'll do is I'll draw parallelly. I mean, you can see both side by side just to get this better idea. Okay. I am changing the frame. So what is my new frame? In frame of Bob. Okay, the Bob is frame at rest or frame which is moving. Moving. So it is performing circular motion. Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Yes. And it is performing uniform circular motion. Correct. So what is the? If I say this is theta and all. What is the acceleration of the frame? So I have one observer which is you know kind of uh, moving along with the ball. This is like uh, the drone, the flying drone, which is always over the top of the. So the flying drone is always over the top of the, the ball. Okay. <laughs> Question is, if the observer is always over the top of this bob, the observer must have the same velocity as that of the bob, right? So observer is which observer, inertial or non-inertial? Observer is inertial, non inertial. Non inertial. Non inertial. And it will have what acceleration? Centripetal, tangential, or both? Tell me. It will have only centripetal because it's moving with uniform velocity isn't it i mean uniform speed actually so it's a uniform circular motion isn't it yes <clears throat> so what is the acceleration of this uh, observer it is towards the center so the acceleration of observer is how much omega square r correct can we say this is the acceleration of observer in the radial direction yes sir so as per this observer, if you draw the ABD, first of all, for this guy, the bob is at rest or moving? At rest. Very good. So what we'll do is we'll draw the ABD. How the ABD look like? MG, tension. But it, it will experience pseudo force in which direction? Opposite to the frame, M, omega square R, correct? This is the pseudo force. 
or centrifugal force, correct? This is centrifugal force. No, not realizing. This is the centrifugal force, which is equals to m into acceleration of frame, which is omega square r. Hello, hello. hello. <laughs> yes, sir. And now, because under the application of these three force, the bob is at rest. The bob is at rest, yes or no? Yes. And see, when something is at rest, how you write? You write net force question zero, so you can write as T cos theta is balancing the mg and T sin theta is balancing the centrifugal force, correct? And now you can replace centrifugal force by m omega square r and rest you know. Yeah, rest you know. Do you know? Yes, you know. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Is this clear? Yes. yes. So what I'll do is I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, we'll go slightly deeper into the idea of uh, observer, centripetal. Oh my God, there's so many things. So this is a very famous question called elevator problem. So we have uh an elevator and not elevator this is like a, some sort of a cage yes cage and this cage is uh rotated about some axis yes yeah <laughs> so this cage is turned about this axis and uh, <clears throat> there is a block and there is the observer and the block is at a distance r but my observer is not uh, sitting over the block but <laughs> you know Omega is something which is same for everyone because this guy will also see the omega same. So if you ask this observer, what is the centrifugal force? You know what, what will be happening here? First of all, this person will have its own acceleration. How much? This person will have own acceleration of the observer is how much? Omega square R naught. Do you realize this? Yes. Because from the axis, the person itself is R naught away. So if a person is R naught away, then it will have access on how much? Omega square R naught. <coughs> but this guy is observing this block. So for him, the block is how much away? So for the observer, the block is not moving in a radius r, it is moving in a radius r plus r. <clears throat> and therefore, you know what he will say? He will say that, see, the block will experience a centrifugal force m omega square, how much? r not r plus, plus r. r. But there's one more thing that we have to understand. This is the centrifugal force due to the perception of this observer. But the observer itself is having this much accession. And therefore, it will also experience a force in the opposite direction to the accession of observer. How much? So this is the pseudo force, right? So centrifugal force when you try to write, okay, you write readily outward and uh, you write uh, opposite to the accession of the observer. So when observer is kind of moving towards center, you write like this. And here, what is happening? <coughs> here, what is happening? There are two forces you can see the block will experience. One, 
m omega square r plus r naught for this this is the force experienced by the block as perceived by the observer because of the distance but because of the accession of the observer itself it will also experience one force inward and therefore if you solve these two question what is the net force acting on this the net force is how much <coughs> the difference of two will be same as m omega square right so what he, what i'm trying to explain is it doesn't matter where the observer is the net centrifugal force is independent of place of observer earlier if you see where i took the observer just over the top now what i'm doing here what i'm doing here i am not taking the show the top my axis is here i am sitting here and i'm trying to find the net force okay and what i'm realizing that net force uh, this guy will tell you that okay you write m omega square r plus r naught because he is thinking that he is the axis and he will tell you to okay, apply this force but because of his own acceleration okay first of all to remember that this observer will see this object to be moving with what is speed the velocity of the block as perceived by the observer is how much omega r plus r not do you realize this this is what he will perceive because for him the block is turning with omega only okay and therefore <coughs> for him the acceleration will be v square by r which will give you the exactly same answer what i said omega square r plus r naught okay and because of his own acceleration which he don't realize that he is also having the acceleration omega naught square r naught which we, we have to apply like this so this force is called pseudo force but this force which i wrote here m omega square r plus this is called centrifugal force this is called pseudo force and the difference the net value is called the okay net radial force mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter how you solve when you are solving in a non inertial frame do not consider the position of observer just consider the position of object from the axis of rotation and the difference will give you the same answer so no need to solve uh, in a lengthy way by writing the two terms <coughs> no 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 need to write no need to write at all okay rather you should only write the net value which is how much the difference of the two will be so net is how much m omega square r you can see and it is acting towards the radial outward isn't it hello 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 yes sir see what, what happens when you when you you know sit on the block itself what will happen will you see block to be moving no no then the only force will be what force the pseudo force correct the only force yes. is pseudo force which is m omega square r so imagine we have two observer the another is sitting over here for this guy because he is always moving along with the block he will never see block to be moving but this guy will see the block to be moving do you see the difference Yes. hello hello and because of the difference the way of writing force will change na? okay so this guy will have acceleration towards center how much omega square so he will apply the pseudo force like this outward and this is the only force 
But for this guy, you can see for this guy, we have to write two forces. Which two force? First, this guy will see block to be moving with this speed. So velocity of block with us to uh, O1. It's called the observer one. O1. Let's call this is O2. So velocity of block to with velocity of block. Okay. So the pseudo force will be, I mean, sorry, the centrifugal force will be how much? So F centrifugal force is how much? M V square bar. Which turns out to be M omega square. But the pseudo force is how much? F pseudo force is also equals to m omega square r naught and therefore the net force is actually so the net force experienced in this frame in the frame o1 is m omega square r but the centrifugal force has changed and the new force has come okay so as we change the frame answer will change uh, no answer remains same then the way of explanation will change so while changing the frame you have to express the same thing in a different fashion but don't go into this complexity if you are not able to understand as of now uh, <coughs> simply think this way that uh, the net centrifugal force always remain m omega square r where r is the distance of object from the axis of rotation, that's it. No other idea you need to know, that's it. Is this clear? Yes. Clear, okay. So, <coughs> We have just three problem in your uh, SC verb, which is very easy. In fact, extremely easy. So we have a box. The box is a very tiny box compared to the length of a rod connected with the box. So for uh, this is the top view. And what you see is the a rod, and it turns by this. And the entire distance of the connection and the center is R. And the size of this uh, box is L. And it is given clearly that L is very, very small than R. What does it mean? The entire box can be treated as a point at this location, right? <laughs> so what is the acceleration of the box? The acceleration of the box is how much? Tell me. It is omega is for capital R? Yes or no? Yes, sir. So imagine it's a long rod, which is like a, the same question of uh, the spaceship. So <laughs> uh, if you cut a part of a spaceship, it will look like this diagram, right? So you go to periphery and cut a small piece. It's the same diagram, correct? A box connected with a rod. The rod is like the radius of this uh, space station, isn't it? And yes. you, you live in this space, you live here. You don't know what is happening outside. And you're not under the direct gravity. So you're under the artificial gravity. So in which direction gravity will act? Gravity will act opposite to the AR, uh, AC, right? So you are yes, under sir. the gravity, which is parallel to this rod, actually, because it's a very small space compared to the rod. <laughs> so this is like a gravity for you. This is called the 
effective gravity which you perceive having value omega square. Very simple. So for you, the world has changed. Now this is the base. The right side of the box is acting as the earth or the ground. You can think this way. And this entire diagram is on a actually horizontal plane. So in fact, uh, gravity is also there, but <coughs> you can think this way. And now what I do is I create a, a slant inside. So if you look from this perspective, if I put a block here, So I can redo the diagram, diagram, this diagram. So if I call this as theta, as per this perceived gravity, how this question will look like? It is like a wedge. It is like a wedge and the block. And the block is at the top of the wedge. And gravity is acting like this. I mean, so gravity is like this, G effective. So if I say this is the length, uh, okay, this length is given L. <coughs> so this is given L, right? How much time it will take to reach the bottom? Which is same as how much time it will take to reach the top? Do you realize that both questions are same? Tell me guys, do you realize this? Both questions are same. Yes. Sir. So if you look from this side, it will give you the right perspective. <coughs> okay. And therefore, uh, if I call this as, uh, this is L, this is theta, so you can definitely get this answer. So S cos theta is L. What is S basically? And uh, the gravitational force will be how much? Tell me guys. Mg effective. So, what is the force acting this side? Mg sine theta. Hmm. Are you sure? Theta is not bottom. No? Theta is upward. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, this is Mg cos theta, uh, which means the axis is actually G cos theta. So, S equals to half <coughs> G effective cos theta into t square that's it and we're done <coughs> so t is how much 2s by g effective cos theta let's put the value 2 uh, s is l sec theta g effective is omega square r and uh, cos theta is cos theta so the time taken by the block to reach the bottom is how much uh, 2L by R and I can act as omega constant, right? This is we can this is how we can act. Do you realize this? So, what you are supposed to do is you can think G effective as omega square, which is acting as an artificial gravity, and now solve the question as you have been solving before. Very typical, like you just create this gravity and imagine this is like new gravity, this is my new earth. And then deal with the problem in that same fashion. It's going to be easy for you if you can think this particular way. I'll just solve the last question. <laughs> okay, any doubt in this? You can ask. Do you have any doubt? Actually, there are just three questions given in S Verma from the pseudo force. Uh, this is the one and the rest two. But uh, uh, there is one very good question which is solved directly in S Verma, which I would like to take into consideration. So, okay, something we have. So we have a large disk. And then 
limited groove. So, there's an input. Okay, anyway, so there's a groove and I know what I'm going to do. Let me go to the axis. So how to create the perfect perception? Not easy. Okay. So now this is group. There's too much of artistic work. We can stop it. So now let's say, okay, to make it simple, I'll take a block. So this block can slide in the groove freely without friction. Okay. So a block can slide freely inside the groove. So a block can slide freely inside the group. Uh, you can check the spring group. I think uh, I don't know the V E or V. But okay. And now it is very close to the axis in the very beginnings, but it's not exactly. It's slightly uh, offset. There's an uh, offset. It's slightly ahead of axis. And the moment you give some angular velocity, let's say I'm giving a constant angular velocity, I have some uh, motorized uh, disk, so I can give what I want, a constant value of uh, omega. So what will happen? <clears throat> because of this concept of centrifugal force, the block is going to be pulled away. And the centrifugal force will act as per the distance of the from the axis. So if I call the radius as uh, R, as you come at some random point, say after some time t you are here at t equals to t and this is t equals to zero and let's say you are uh, x distance away. What is the centrifugal force experienced by this block? So FCF is how much at any instant? It is going to be m omega square x, right? Correct. All other forces uh, will be either upward or uh, perpendicular, but the motion along the groove is only governed by this force, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Unless I not introduce any friction, which I'm not going to do right now. So this is the force which will give you the acceleration along the groove. And that's why if you solve this question, I should solve in the frame of the disc only because in the disc frame I know it is going this way. In the ground frame, the path of the block is radially, it's like a spiral, right? So what is the path of the block in the frame of uh, ground? Do you realize? As it goes away from the center, it also turns, right? Mm -hmm. Hello, hello, hello. Yes. Sir. <laughs> So the actual path is dangerous. It's like a, a spiral path is spiraling out. So we always solve question in a frame in which the path is kind of nice, simple. And therefore, 
uh, I will solve this question in the frame of disk only. I will not solve in the frame of ground. So this is the ground frame path. So I'll stick to the, now, okay. Now this is the only force. And so we have tried the laws of motion. So net force goes to mass into, we call it a, a radial axis in AX because that's, so let's say this X axis is attached to the disc. Okay, that's always, so as the disc will turn, X axis will also turn. So you will never feel that you are changing the, or shifting the axis. And therefore, uh, oh, I should not cut here. So the AX turns out to how much? Omega square X, and now you know how to solve. So VX, DVX by DX. And therefore, the, uh, the radial component of uh, velocity you can derive. So when you had x almost 0, I mean, because exact 0 is difficult, 0. And this is 0. So Vx is square by 2 minus 0 square by 2 is omega square x square by 2, which means the Vx turns out to be omega x. Okay. So at the time of leaving, therefore, at the time of uh, leaving, Tell me guys, what we can at the time of leaving, what will happen? When you are about to leave the surface, what will happen? The Vx becomes omega r because x equals to r. Correct? But one velocity which is always there called the tensile velocity. So when you leave, and then now that's the tricky part. This is the part which you need to understand. So again, if you look from the top view uh, and if you look at the group part, generally in the examination, you will see this diagram. Uh, I have done, I try to draw the three dimensional, but this is the diagram which will come across. So when you are about to leave, you know, you, you never un understood one thing. Your velocity in this direction is always constant. You know how much? Omega into? The distance from the axis, right? And this is it is r. But when you're leaving the uh, group, you have also obtained this velocity, which you derive actually. And this is by default because of the constant. This is the due to constant of group. And therefore, your actual the your net speed at the time of leaving this way. It is not uh, the way. You obtain this is the actual. So B is actually. And that's very interesting. So your answer is actually root 2 omega. Okay, both are same. Okay. <laughs> so when it will leave the surface, will it fly like this or fly like this? So the actual path of fly will be 1, 2, or 3. Which way the block will leave the surface? It will live in which direction? Hello, hello, hello. Two, two. Two. I mean, that's obvious. And therefore, if I if I uh, also tell you that if the height of the disk uh, from the ground is uh, capital H, how much time it will take to fall? It is root 2, 2 under root 2 h by g. So let's say after leaving the disk, you perform the projectile path. <coughs> okay. So when you're leaving the edge of the disk,
you know your speed is not uh, omega is root 2 omega r and this is h so the range will be like this <coughs> so what will be the direction but uh, you will actually go r equals to how much v not into under root 2h by g right this is the range so you may also come across a range problem i hope this is clear to all of you uh there's one more part projectile and one more part is like what is the vx we got omega x this you can write as dx by dt is omega x <coughs> most linear calculation this was j advanced question actually which will give you that dx or dx is how much omega dt so if you integrate I, i'll take some x not because we cannot take uh, uh g right okay in fact uh, i'll solve that question on that too yeah i hope this is clear this question is clear yes so this is called the let's name it group problem and always remember that to solve any problem of a group you always have to solve in the frame <laughs> in which the group is kind of fixed and maybe the last question for the chapter and this chapter is over okay let's do this top view top view of group in our this so it's the same question and <clears throat> now the place of a release is not near center it is somewhere here. So you release from initial distance l and this is t equal to zero and now from here it will start and we can take x so quickly also we can try to understand what we have been so a radial equals to omega square r i can solve in r uh, x what is it radial i write a r which is looks nice to me so v r v v r is omega r d r i'm doing all the real arrangement at once and it is l to r this is g to v r so this will become omega square this will be vr turns out to be omega r square minus l square <laughs> and this is connected as dr by dt so this is uh, again l to r And this is slightly uh, difficult integration for you guys. So dr by r square minus l square to solve this question, we have to write uh, r equals to l sec theta. So dr becomes <laughs> and therefore uh, the uh, I can write <laughs> as. On and this is uh, L square comes L six is comes one is ten square so ten so this is yes and so and then what you get here is something interesting it's a sub theta delta and this integration is very famous it is L n sub theta plus ten 
So, so if you saw uh, on the LHS, uh, you will get uh, six theta plus ten theta. Uh, LN, I take the other side it becomes e power omega t. And uh, there is a trick actually, there is a trick of solving. But if sec theta plus 10 theta is e power omega t, then uh, sec theta minus 10 theta becomes minus omega because sec square minus 10 square is one. So obviously they are inverse of each other. And by solving, you can get the answer sec theta equals to e power omega t plus e power omega t by two and then theta is okay so that is like how you have to solve and this was a j advanced question uh, the question was easy but uh, most of the students got stuck uh, there so how to do the integration it's not difficult it's a bit tricky question so i'm not going to solve completely uh, when you will see the question, then you will come to know what exactly they want and how much you should go, go about. So that's the end of uh, circular motion for you guys. And our next topic is going to be work energy power. Your homework is to complete SVRMA. And uh, if you're done with SVRMA, I, I think I have shared the resonance sheet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.